All right, what's up everybody? Thanks for clicking this video. Thanks for tuning into my channel. My name is Simon Hill, black American from Louisiana, coming to you live from Budapest, Hungary. Today is July 12th, 2024. It's 6, 10 p.m. And I'm here with my beautiful wife. Say hi, boo. Hi everyone, I'm Akti and I'm from Turkey. And this is episode 60 and we are reviewing the 1998 film titled Beloved from Harpo Productions, which was Oprah's uh, production company, still is her production company. And this was the first film that she made. And uh, we watched it a few days ago. We tried to do the review a few days ago, but it's too damn hot here in Budapest to be fighting with the fan in the background. And, you know, I got a little grouchy, so we had to, like, cut it short. But now we're doing it on a weekend, on Friday. I feel good. Acti, how do you feel? I feel great. All right, all right. And Acti, you know I love you with all my heart, right? Oh, I love you too. And she's going to have the best take on this movie because she did some research. She's smarter than me, guys. She's smarter than me. I'm ready. So so, yeah, yeah. So this film, Beloved, is based on the very famous book from 1987, uh, written by Toni Morrison, who is one of the greatest black American female writers of her generation, probably still now, right? Even though she has passed on, I believe. And uh, rest in peace to Toni Morrison. Uh, but yeah, this film stars a all-star cast, Oprah Winfrey playing the main character, Sete, Danny Glover as Paul D, Fendiway Newton as Beloved, Kimberly Elise as Denver, and, uh, Hill Harper as Hallie, uh, Bea Richards as Baby Shugs. A lot of people, a lot of black all-stars in this thing. And, uh, yeah, so how did you feel after we watched this film? Um, I felt really good about it. I, it definitely was a very impactful movie. Uh, there were like some amateurish things in there, I would say, but it is an early made movie. Like it's 1998. Uh, but overall, like it had great themes, you know, very, you know, nicely put ideas there. And I really thought like, despite being directed by a white director, I thought it was like not from the white gaze and uh, I overall really liked it. Mm, mm. Y'all got to remember my wife is young guys. She was born in 1998. So she says this movie's so old. It's from 1998. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it, I was zero years old when this movie was, you know, published. <laughs> I I disagree with you that the film feels amateurish. I feel like the graphics and the effects hold up well. I don't feel like there's like cheesy, you know, horror graphics that you would see in like a, you know, early 90s or even mid 90s horror film. It holds up very well, I feel like, because they use lighting and they use different filters on the camera to make things, you know, uh, look otherworldly or ethereal. That's what I'm, that's what I'm seeing from it. Mm, I mean, I don't, like, I'm not saying every scene was like that, but there were certain scenes where I felt like I was out of the movie because of, you know, those props or effects. Mm -hmm. But I would say in general, like, the way the actors are acting and because the story is so compelling, it covers up for that. So, yeah, like, it still holds up good because of those things. Right. I mean, all the actors who cried, I felt like those were real tears. Yeah, definitely. Like, there were no flaws in acting. No flaws in the acting at all. Now, you know, we talked about how the film looks. This film actually was a bomb at the box office because it cost $80 million to make, and it only made $20 million. Though I feel like with the DVD sales, VHS tape sales afterwards, like, this thing is like ghetto platinum. But why do you think this movie cost $80 million? I feel like this could have easily been a $2 million project that could have, like, doubled, tripled its money in return. I'm thinking it was just the salaries for Danny, Oprah. Like, if you're going to make me play <laughs> in another slave film, like, you got to pay top dollar. I don't know. What do you think? Uh, I mean, yeah, definitely the prices, like, the, the pay for the actors was, I think, a lot. But also, like, it's a three-hour movie. So I think it took a long time to get everything right mm -hmm. in this movie because there are very complex scenes and like a lot of flashbacks and things like that. So maybe like editing also took a long time and a lot of money uh, like for those people to get paid as well. And like, yeah, when you watch the movie, you can see there is a lot of work put in it. 
So maybe that's why, but maybe the reason it flopped is like because of the topic and the length of the movie. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, like, I don't know if, you know, every family wants to see, you know, a, a movie about slavery for three hours on the weekend in 1998. Right. right. I feel like in 1998, the biggest movies were like major blockbuster action films, because I feel like in 98, it was like, you know, Independence Day, uh, you know, Die Hard 7, uh, <laughs> the beginning of the MCU with like Blade and stuff like that. Like, I feel like around that time, people just wanted to go to the movies and see stuff explode rather than, you know, beloved have butterflies burst out of her pregnant belly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can I can definitely see like this movie was underrated mm -hmm. or I think it still is mm -hmm. because it's not like in those, you know, top movie lists. But yeah. for me, it is, you know, one of them, I would say I definitely put this movie in my top like hundred Right, right. I think this film was ahead of its time because this is black horror and like done really, really well. But, you know, black horror didn't really start to pop off until Get Out, which was what, 2015, 16, something like that. Like this is a, in my opinion, a psychological, dark, dark, dark horror film. And I feel like at that time, people didn't really know how to either market it or people didn't know what to expect going into it. So they probably just said, hey, did you like Color Purple? Come check this out. But this is like Color Purple with like blood, snot, and period juice or something. Like this is not <laughs> Color Purple where you feel all warm and fuzzy inside, really. This is sort of like disturbing. I don't know. What do you think? It is disturbing. Um, I guess like I would say it is like a drama thriller when Color Purple is more like drama only, mm. and it's definitely better than Emancipation with oh, yeah. Will Smith. It's like, if you want to see a movie, like, about slavery and stuff, don't go, don't see Emancipation, see this movie. <laughs> okay. Like, <laughs> yeah, sorry, but Will. Is, but this is, like, a, a film because, it, you know, it's, it's, it's part slave film, but it takes place after slavery, right? So it's, like, in this weird thing where it's, like, the beginning of a new chapter while also the final chapter is slowly closing, right? But the people are sort of caught in the, in the flux of this change, right? And it's, it's hard to imagine what it's like to live in a world where one day you are owned by somebody else and then the next day you're free. Like, how do you rationalize that? Yeah, there's definitely like, Yes, it is about slavery, but it's more like a slavery is a main element in this movie to tell the story. But it is like more like a story of these people and how they like sort of handled the trauma of slavery. So it's not like we don't see them, you know, during the slavery time. We have flashbacks, but right. yeah, it's, it, I think there is it's more about the characters, which makes it better. Right, and right. not cheesy when it comes to like those type of slavery movies, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's one of the better movies related to slavery, I would say. Right. Now I would not put this above color purple, uh, by any means, though there were parts that were very interesting to me and related to me more than color purple. Uh, but you know, when I think about this film, even though it is a very dark horror, Even though it is psychological in nature, there are parts of this film that if you have a truly effed up sense of humor, you might look at this and laugh, like laugh <laughs> because of how, because like, I feel like if you're black, like you have to develop a sort of sick sense of humor just to get through life. You know what I mean? So like when Beloved is making strange faces or like, you know, uh, they're taking her milk when they're taking Sete's milk, you, you just might crackle a little bit if If you've probably seen this the second time, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, I think like this purple is as good. I'm sorry. This movie is as good as co the color purple. Uh, I, I still prefer the color purple when compared to this movie, but I think it does have like a really good complex storyline and a lot of symbols there. So that's why maybe I can see if people put this movie along with Color Purple. 
Now, now you cried when we watched Color Purple. Like you had real tears, Swan. I'll never forget that. But with this one, I didn't see a tear. Um, I mean, I got that like a little tingle in my nose mm -hmm. in one of the scenes, which we will discuss. But mm -hmm. yeah, other than that, I didn't really cry because yeah, it did have that thriller sense. Mm -hmm. So you know, I guess maybe that's why. But right. there are definitely like very gruesome scenes. And very sad scenes in this movie as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, you were talking about the white director earlier, and you felt like the white director did a good job on telling this story, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, you know, the guy who directed this film, his name is Jonathan Dem. He passed away. He was a very prolific uh, American filmmaker. Uh, but... Once again, I feel like, you know, just like how Color Purple was done by Spielberg and he didn't have chicken and watermelon, you know, uh, Aza Iza, this, all that sort of talk, stuff like that. Like, Beloved doesn't feel like it's done through the white gaze, I would say. What do you think? Yeah, I agree with that. But I think both of these, you know, movies have in common is that they were taken from a book mm. and those books were actually written by black people. Mm -hmm. So I think that helps the directors a lot. Right. Especially if the author was involved, right? Because, you know, Toni Morrison was definitely alive during this time. So she could have been consulted to, you know, uh, make sure it's authentic to the source material. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, like also what makes this movie great is that I didn't know this the first time we were trying to review this movie, but... Like Toni Morrison, his, his, her book got a lot of recognition. You know, she was the first black woman to win a Nobel Prize in literature, a Pulitzer Prize as well. And then I also found out that, you know, she got this idea for the story from an actual person who was alive during that time. And uh, that was really fascinating for me to find out, like, all of this was, like, too real. It was sort of sad. But it was also, like, brilliant as well. Mm, mm. The only thing I found from my research is that the only person nominated for an Oscar for this film was the white woman who designed the costumes. Damn. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if you think about it, costumes were good, but, you know, we're not going to give a nomination to Oprah. Exactly. You know? Racism. That's, that's the ism right there. <laughs> wow. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, when I think about it, like, the costumes of especially Beloved was cool. Because uh, she had that sort of gothic vibe to mm -hmm. her, like, wearing dark clothes and stuff. But, yeah. yeah. Now, tell us about the woman who this book is, like, based on. Like, just brief overview. Of yeah, this. yeah. So, this woman was called Margaret Garner, or also Peggy. And she died in 1858. And she was an enslaved African-American, and she actually um, killed her own daughter uh, and other, and she intended to kill her other three children rather than going back into the slavery. And, uh, yeah, she ended up, like, being trialed, and they didn't know whether to trial, put her on trial as a free human being or as a property, but... Uh, in the end, she ended up going back into the institution, into the slavery farm, and then she, you know, passed away in there. Mm. But this was, like, such a big news story back then as well because, yeah, it's a big thing when, you know, mom mothers murder their own children. Right. I say this all the time about slavery. Like, the crazy thing is, like, what we know about it, how horrific it is, it's not even scratching the surface because there are millions of stories that, went, you know, unknown, right? And we'll never know them. Entire lives, entire generations of people whose stories that we'll never know of what they went through, what they survived, what they learned, what they witnessed. It's such a crazy thing. And I didn't know about that story until you sent it to me. Um, as far as like the book Beloved, for me, I, tr I remember being assigned reading this in like English class by like my white English teacher in high school. And all I remembered from it is that like, I tried to read it, but it was very confusing. And there was a part in there where Sete was talking about the guys at Sweet Home used to, like, have sex with donkeys because there were no women at Sweet Home or very few, something like that. I don't know. That's all I know. But did you ever hear about this book before we watched the movie? 
No, I did not. And, uh, yeah, I'm very curious. Like maybe if we can get our hands on this novel, I would like to read it because I'm sure like the novel is even deeper. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I would cry if I, if I read this novel. <laughs> But, you know, they say yeah. the book is always better than the movie, and this one is going to be a lot darker. A lot. Um, yeah. the, the text is probably going to take you to places you couldn't imagine. But once again, shout out to Toni Morrison. Let's jump into the film real quick. So basically, the movie opens with like the uh, it's winter time, and the camera pans down to this cemetery, and there's basically a grave that doesn't have a birth date or a death date. All it says on it is beloved while it's covered with snow. And then uh, we're shown a picture of this house that looks eerily similar to the color purple house on the edge of a farm somewhere. And it says 1865 uh, Cincinnati, Ohio or somewhere in Ohio. I forgot exactly. Uh, and then we're seen inside the house and the house is shaking, rocking back and forth. Two little black boys are holding on to each other, screaming, mama, help, mama, help. A dog is flying around the living room and then a dog gets slammed into the wall. The mother is actually calm the entire time. She picks up the dog who had its eye pop out of its socket. She's trying to fix the dog's eye back into its head. And the two boys, you know, say, we're going to leave this house. And their sister is saying, don't go, don't go. But the boys are like, nope, we leaving. <laughs> We're sick of this. And these two boys who don't look any older than like 13 or 14, right? They, they run out of the house in the middle of winter with like their bags in hand. And then, you know, uh, the, the screen goes black, uh, flash forwards to eight years later. And, uh, this woman is like, you know, working the fields, working the farm. And we see that this woman is played by Oprah. And this character's name is Sete. And as she's like working the fields, she sees this strange man walk up to her gate. Right. Uh, by the way, this is uncommon for her because everybody else in the town drives by on their their buggies, their carts, their horses and just stares at their house. But they never say hi. They never do anything. Uh, but this man walks up and Sete recognizes him and says, oh, shit, that's Mr. Mr. <laughs> It's Mr. from the color purple and he's back to cause hell. <laughs> it's the origin story. <laughs> Ain't that right, acting? Yeah, there were definitely like, <laughs> I was just having a lot of flashbacks to color purple because there were a lot of similarities uh, right. between like the characters, what they were doing. And yeah, it was, it was, I think they did it on purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Harpo was, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, anyway, so no. Sete, played by Oprah, is greeted by Danny Glover, who plays a guy named Paul D. Paul D says, I've been walking for a long time. I'm glad to see you, um, uh, Sete. It's been years since we've not last seen each other back at Sweet Home. And, uh, you know, Paul D says, I've been real tired, but let me come on inside. And, you know, Sete invites him inside. But when she opens the door to her house, the house, like, turns red. And Paul D says, girl, what type of demon you got in here? And she said, it, it ain't going to bother nobody. And so he forces himself to walk through the hallway, fighting the evil energy that's trying to push him out. And then when he makes it into the kitchen, it stops. And uh, so, yeah, um, they're like talking in the kitchen. Uh, we find out that Sete was an escaped slave who escaped from this plantation called Sweet Home. And Paul D actually, you know, is from that same plantation, too. That's how they know each other. Right. But it's 1865. So that means slavery just ended. But Sete has been living at this house, as we see, much longer. Right. So that means she escaped. But maybe Paul D just waited slavery out and he was eventually free. But uh, they haven't seen each other. They're reconnecting. And then Sete talks about the time she tried to escape um, as she's making bread. And she's explaining the story. And she goes into she's not saying exactly what happened, but she keeps on saying they took my milk. They took my milk. And she's having flashbacks to when she was raped in the barn by these slave masters while one of the slave masters whose name is school teacher is reading the Bible over her while these other two guys are like sucking on her chest and taking her milk from her. And, um, you know, we're disturbed as the audience, but Paul D doesn't know. He then comes up from behind, you know, Sete and like grabs her breasts <laughs> in a sexual way, but also in a comforting way as well. And uh, we also see that Sete has, you know, scars on her backs from getting whipped 
and it looks like a tree. And, uh, you know, Paul D opens it and takes a look at that. And uh, they're about to get real physical. But then a demon starts like attacking the house. And then Paul D fights the demon by pushing the table, uh, you know, and then the demon stops shaking the house. And then Paul D and Sete go upstairs and have sex. What did you think about like the first, I guess, 15 minutes of the film? Okay, so the opening part where we see like the past, uh, I was a bit judgmental of that because like the dog looked a bit fake, like when it was thrown into the wall. So I was like, okay, maybe this is not gonna, this movie is not gonna have like the best, you know, um, cinematics or something like that. I was thinking that like that a little bit. But, of course, like, I was interested because, you know, I was like, okay, maybe it's going to be, like, a horror movie. I didn't know, like, the genre of this movie because when if you look at the poster, it looks like a, you know, a second color purple. It doesn't have any, you know, <laughs> means of being a horror movie in the now poster. Let's just, let's just get this out the way. Like, this film bombed at the box office and it's not as famous because people just see this as them trying to remake color purple. And it was marketed as such. But go yeah, ahead. I think it's possible. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like definitely poster doesn't give that vibe. So I was so, sort of surprised. I didn't know what was happening. And about like when, you know, Paul D comes with Sete, she, they said sit down and he asked like, how's Shugs? And there's like a person called, uh, Suggs. And, uh, yeah, and then Seta says, oh, she died, but she died peacefully, and uh, I'm sorry that you didn't get to see her, and things like that. So, and then when he enters the house, I thought the house was haunted by Suggs, because he sees this, like, woman a little bit, like, for one second. So, I'm thinking, okay, it's Suggs, and she died, and she's haunting the house, and then when they try to get physical... I thought she doesn't want them to get physical mm -hmm. and uh, she got mad and then she attacked like Paul D's character. And that's mm -hmm. what I was thinking. But as for like the flashbacks of Sete, it was definitely very like hard to watch. Like one of the worst scenes of the movie right off the bat, but it's like hurtful because you know, this sort of thing might've happened or probably happened in the past. And that's what makes it, like, truly bad. Mm -hmm. All right. My first impressions of the first 15 minutes of the film is that Oprah in this film actually looks pretty damn fine. Acting, no offense. I don't mean any offense by that. But we've never seen Oprah sort of, like, as a sex symbol. But here in 1998, I feel like she was in her prime, like, physical prime, low-key. Am I tripping or am I not? No, I I think I think Oprah is a baddie in this movie as well. Mm, yeah, I think like also a lot of the reason why like most people don't see her as like this sexy woman is because she was so powerful and she was so powerful as a black woman in times of like very, you know, hard patriarchy and she yeah. always like rode against that. Yeah, so, no, definitely. I mean, she's yeah. intimidating to a lot of men because she is powerful like she's a real billionaire with that b multiple b's you get what i'm saying and on top of that she is like unapologetically black in her aesthetics right wide nose big lips you know 4c hair and we live in a white supremacist world where all of those things are considered not beautiful so yeah, yeah oprah is going to be you know always derided in the media as like not attractive uh, but let's keep it real she's gone up and down in her weight a lot over the years there were times when oprah looked like you know Look like a blimp. <laughs> Let's keep it a buck. But she was felt in this film. I don't know if it was the waist trainer, the girdle, whatever. She was looking bad. I see why Paul. It's the youth, you know. It's the youth. Yeah. I mean, she was younger. She was younger in color purple, but she didn't look like that in color purple. Uh, she did towards the end, but in color purple, in the beginning, her character is like worn out. Um, so maybe that's why and then at towards the end she pulls it off like she, mm, and she she looks better i see i see i see but anyway uh another thing i want to say is like at, in the beginning when she's fixing the dog right it made me think like okay this woman is just she's not callous or careless right she probably is living with this demon around and she is going to do whatever it takes 
to survive, right? Because she could have easily let the dog die or just stared at the dog or cared for her kids, right? But she probably knew, like, I'm going to try to keep as much normalcy as possible. Any comments about her fixing the dog? Yeah, to me, I I thought, like, okay, she's used to this. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. she fixed that dog a couple of times, and she knows there's a ghost in her house. She's living with it. She's not bothered by the ghost. Mm-hmm. And maybe the ghost is her friend. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, moving on, you know, when Paul D. and Sete, like, are starting to get sexual in the kitchen and stuff like that, uh, two things, you know, I like how Paul D. is finding beauty in the pain that uh, Sete had to live through, right? And it was good to see Danny Glover sort of, like, in a redemption kind of way, play this black male character who's trying to do something to uplift the black women around him. You get what I'm saying? Not like Mr. who was constantly, like, beating down women until the very end of Color Purple, right? Here in this film, both of them, Sete and Paul D., are trying to heal each other through sex in a way, right? And this is something I've never seen in a film before. Like, most of the time in films, they show sex as something that's just lust or, or you know, just wanting that person's body. But these people are having sex to sort of, like, you know, recuperate with each other, show their flaws, let the let their guard down. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, and I think, like, a lot of the acting here was really good because with a scene like that, I feel like it can go very wrong because you have like a woman, you know, remembering her past trauma and she has a sexual trauma because they were, you know, raping her. So after, right after that, when, you know, Paul D approaches her, it can go like very wrong and you Mm -hmm. can feel like Paul D is horny and, and stuff like that. But here and every time they have like SEX, Mm-hmm. Uh, you can feel the nurturing nature of it. So, right. yeah. But there is a bit of distrust, too, because, yeah, he just showed up, and now a few minutes later he's knocking the boots, right? But, you know, you don't know exactly where the film is going. Like, is Paul D... If you're watching this for the first time, you might be thinking, okay, is Paul D just trying to hit it and quit it? Or is he actually trying to build a life with this woman? You get what I'm saying? Yeah, but I think it was okay because Sethe was, like, responding to it. Yeah. So, yeah. also, for me, it felt like Sethe didn't come for years. Yeah. And uh, now, like, she has a safe environment to enjoy her sexuality. It felt mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, yeah. But moving on in the film, we're introduced to Denver. And Denver is, you know, Sethe's daughter, uh, played by Kimberly Elise who has the meanest scowl on her face all the time. Like, Kimberly Elise has, like, like resting bitch face to the max. I don't know how to say it. She never looks nice unless she's, like, purposely smiling. <laughs> but I know that's how, what the character demanded. Uh, but basically, you know, while Sete and Paul D are, like, getting it on upstairs, Denver is, you know, downstairs trying to make a biscuit. She burns a biscuit. Then she sits on the front porch of the house and everybody is driving by the house staring at her. And she's just sitting here trying to eat a burnt biscuit alone. And nobody, she has no friends, no family, nothing. And then, you know, uh, at night, Paul D and uh, Paul D is like dreaming. Right. And he's having all these nightmares. Right. Remembering school teacher, remembering sweet home. And so is that day, too. So like you know, images of Sete getting raped are playing in the background. School teacher, the slave master, saying that Sete is an animal, reading from the Bible while she's getting raped. It was, you know, all the real. And then Paul D. wakes up out of his sleep like, ah, you know, I can't deal with all this. And that's what makes me feel like this film is a psychological thriller and horror, right? Because if you watch it the first time, you might be thinking, okay, why is this mean looking girl always looking mad in the house? Is she the demon? Is she going to kill somebody? And then the other thing too is like psychological thriller means dealing with the human psychology and Paul D and Sete are dealing with PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder or post-traumatic slave disorder because they're constantly reminded of all the times they were on the plantation and and the things that you know they went through so yeah any comments about that yeah i mean you know the way that they are dreaming it does show like you know even though they can get through the normal day 
they are able to like, they're not able to forget everything that happened in their unconscious. And that's what we usually see in our nightmares or in our dreams. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's that psychological element, but yeah, overall, I do think like, you know, there is a, also a lot of like just sadness in everything that they live through. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, there's like a psychological exploration for each of the characters, at least like the main characters. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like I, I do want to say like the, from the first time I saw Denver, even though she might have like this, you know, mad and sad face all the time, I had a sympathy towards her character. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe it's because like, uh, when we, when we're first introduced to her, she sort of has like this crisis mm -hmm. and she says like something like, I can't do this anymore. Like I'm stuck here. I don't know anything else and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. We don't know if she's saying it like in a mental way or a physical way. Mm -hmm. But then later on when she sits on the porch and she, you know, she's looking outside yeah. and people are looking at her weird, maybe we can see like it's physical and mental. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. It's, it's you know, number one, Denver is what, maybe 16 years old, 15? Yeah. Like he's literally a kid. She can't live without her mom. Uh, and yeah, it's mental as well because she saw the ghost, the trauma, and maybe she also heard some of the other stories as well, you know? Yeah, definitely. So right off the bat, I sympathized with her, even though like she was sort of mean in certain parts of the movie. Mm -hmm. I, I liked her character. Yeah. Yeah. So moving on in the story, Paul D, you know, he's trying to convince, uh, you know, Sete, like, girl, let's build a life together. I was going to find me some work, girl. Tell me where to go look for work. <laughs> and at first, Sete is like hesitant, but she's like, OK, you can stay at the house. Just, you know. Try to find some work, go downtown, whatever. And, uh, you know, next thing that happens is Sete, you know, is comforting Denver while she's sleeping. And Denver is like, is the ghost gone for real? Because, you know, Paul D like beat up a ghost to get some coochie. So, <laughs> so Denver's like, you know, I miss my sister. You know, I know that was my sister that was haunting us and I miss her, you know, but, uh, yeah. Uh, after that, we see like a, a butterfly floating down a river, which is a, an allusion to later. And then we see, oh, something, something crazy. Like, yeah, basically this woman comes out of the water wearing like a full black gothic dress. And she's like wheezing, snoring, coughing, and she's covered in like swamp juice. And then she lays down on a tree and she like sleeps there all night while bugs like crawl out of her eyes, her mouth, her everything. And uh yeah, this is our introduction to Beloved. And Beloved is played by the woman whose name is Sandiwe Newton. And uh yeah, that's what did you think about all three of those scenes or any of those? Go ahead. Um yeah, I really like, you know, the Paul D came and Denver was sort of like, you know, doubting him. He, he also, like the audience, he didn't know, like, whether Paul D just wanted some coochie or was he actually, like, care, caring of, uh, Sethe. And, uh, I liked Paul D and Sethe's dynamic. Um, and I like the fact that, like, they went to this, um, fair. I don't know if you were gonna talk about that later. Yeah, but, that's later. Okay, okay. But I thought Paul D was, like, trying to get close to Sethe and Denver. Uh -huh. Um, and yeah, like when I saw first time Beloved, the character Beloved, I was like, what the hell is that? Like, I could not make sense of it. Why are there bugs? Uh -huh. uh, it definitely felt like, yeah, like you got that. Okay. Maybe this is like a zombie or uh -huh. like a ghost, something, but she's uh -huh. not a human being. Like, right. you know, she's something from out of this world. Yeah. So that's what I thought. Yeah. Number one, like this is what makes this film. I think so. How can I say this? I, I feel like a lot of people might watch this film and hate it, even if you really like black cinema, because there are some weird ass parts in here. Like <laughs> beloved as a character is just hella weird. And you'll either you'll either love the way the character is portrayed or hate it. Right. Because it is creepy when she comes out of the water. But later on, we'll see that, you know, the character might get a bit annoying. Right. But. I really liked the outfit. I really liked how the bugs were crawling all over her. It made me think of, 
you know, being in Louisiana. And if you stand outside at night, you know, in a hot summer night, like you will find all sorts of stuff just crawling on your pants. If you're like out there by the river or the bayou or something like very, very authentic, you know, very authentic. And uh, yeah, the next thing they do go to a carnival. And I was going to talk about that because Paul D says, I got two dollars. Let me take you and your daughter out, Sete, to the carnival. And I was like, damn, I miss those times. Two dollars, you can take somebody out, <laughs> order all sorts of drinks. He said two dollars, like he was balling out of control. <laughs> and yeah, he takes her to the carnival. And the only scene I really want to talk about at the carnival is, you know, Paul D, you know, gets closer to Denver by offering her a drink and stuff like that and like tries to show he's a good man and he wants to be a good like step daddy. And I, the other thing I want to talk about is like at that carnival, there was a character, a man who was playing the African savage, which was a real thing that they used to have in circuses at that time. Like they would get black people like we saw in that film, Black Venus, right, to act like uh, a monkey and orangutan for the entertainment of white people mostly. But this was the first time I saw like black people saying like, oh, look at that man. I knew that man back at, at Sweet Home. And he looked like a, he looked like one of the Africans or something like that. You get what I'm saying? So I thought that was interesting to see black people like laughing and, and, and being entertained by those stereotypes of us. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. I think I also thought when I saw that, like, uh, you know, African savage man show, I mm -hmm. also immediately thought of Venus as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that man definitely looked like he was from Louisiana or something. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> he was from the South or, and that was also a joke made. Mm -hmm. But I think at that time, like the black people's struggle were so much about survival that there wasn't even that much time to contemplate about like the stereotypes yeah. really. Like they were trying to stay alive and yeah. not get raped and not get killed. But I think that's an interesting dynamic because like there's so many times today where black people like we're entertained by like stereotypes of us you get what i'm saying like grooving gorilla you remember that big dude on instagram with the short shorts yeah dancing all the time like that is such a sambo ish character but black people laugh at it i mean hell i laughed at it i thought a few grooving gorilla shorts were funny you get what i'm saying so and if you think about it You could say like hip hop to some degree. There are people who are obviously playing up a caricature, right? People who are obviously saying, I'm the super thug, I'm the super gangster to just get the money, get the dollars. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, I think it's okay to laugh at yourself or like people like you and laugh at those stereotypes because that is a way of survival also, like a psychological survival. But it does become problematic when, like, people who abuse you do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, yeah, and, and at that time, I was also, like, sort of thinking this was the entertainment of that time. Like, this was the Netflix. This was the, you know, movie theater of that time, just going to the fair, getting a lemonade that probably was, like, two drops of lemon and, like, the rest of it was water. Because that lemonade looked like water. The rest of it was gin. Back then, everybody was drunk. Okay. <laughs> okay, they were drinking that moonshine. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, like, it was nice to see that environment and sort of, like, get into the feeling of that, like, time. Mm -hmm. Definitely was interesting also to see, like you said, see, like, black people having their time at the fair and uh, seeing black stereotypes but as well as like you know white folks performing for them as well like bearded lady or mm -hmm. uh you know stuff like that right right yeah. right well moving on you know they're at the fair and we also see that other ladies there are looking at sete like oh, she's here oh my god she's here that lets us know even more that she's sort of ostracized in the town and as they're leaving the fair they come back to sete's house And they see the swamp lady laid up on a stump, laid up on a stump in front of her home. So Sete, as soon as she sees the woman, she runs to the side of her house and instantly starts peeing like a shower head. Like it's like her water broke, but it wasn't like her water broke. It was just like a very powerful drunk pee that she had been holding all night because her Tinder date would not shut up. And it was like, <sighs> once again, this movie is weird. It was hella weird. And so then they bring the girl into the house. And then they ask her, what's her name? And she croaks out, Bay. 
E L O V E D. Beloved. I'm like, oh, and Denver says, oh, that's a, that's a pretty name. What the hell is going on? What the fuck is this movie? Acti, Acti, take control. I'm about to scream. Those were my exact thoughts. Like when I saw Oprah peeing like a shower head, I was like, oh my God, what are they making this woman do? <laughs> I did, I was so like, you know, mm-hmm. taken aback, and I was also trying to make sense of it, like mm-hmm. because you don't make sense of it really until later. Mm-hmm. And at that point, you're just like, "What the hell?" Mm-hmm. And beloved, she's definitely very like for me. I was disturbed by her voice, by mm-hmm. her like facial expressions and demeanor, and I think that's what they wanted as well. Yeah. Um. So yeah, but definitely like you. You don't know if she's a child. Or if she's acting like a child or she's mm-hmm. an adult because she does look like a teenager. Yeah. Well, I also thought, okay, maybe did she like escape from slavery as well? Like, mm-hmm. I don't know what's wrong like with her or if she's like real or not. I, yeah. I was also thinking about that as well. Like if she's an imagination of Sethe yeah. in Denver. Uh, so yeah, it was definitely very weird. Yeah, very weird. So, uh, basically Denver is like taking care of, uh, beloved while Sete and Paul D continue to like giggle throughout the house like teenagers and sneak away to have sex every now and then. And, uh, yeah, beloved is kind of nasty. Like she pees and poops in the bed and Denver has to wash out everything while she's continuing to watch after this girl. But it's kind of cute seeing Denver take care of her because Obviously, Denver did not have any friends, any social life. So she's just happy to have somebody around, even if she is, you know, a weird girl who speaks like a frog. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, definitely for Denver, she was like that long, you know, mm, searched friend. Mm -hmm. And even though like Denver, sorry, um, Beloved was super weird, maybe Denver was like, I found someone even weirder than me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, you know, maybe this puts me at an advantage as well. Mm-hmm. And also, like, um, you know, Beloved was acting like she had obsessive compulsive behavior disorder. She was like, at one moment, she was having fun and dancing around with Denver. And then another moment, she would get mad at her. And And you can see, like, in some of the scenes and stuff, she's sort of also obsessed with Sethe as well Mm. and she's like just very curious about Sethe and she constantly asks questions about her to her or to Denver so Mm. yeah I was like very confused by all of that because I was like does she does beloved love Denver as well or she doesn't Mm -hmm. I'm not I wasn't sure yeah 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 I think um you know beloved just was like sort of learning and growing as she was there in the house uh, but also she came there with a mission in mind and we find out about that more. So, you know, basically a few scenes later, Beloved sits down in front of Sete in front of the fireplace and says, tell me about your diamonds. And Sete says, you know, what do I look like wearing some diamonds? And she says, I've seen you with them before, it says Beloved and stuff like that. Denver says, I've never seen you with them. And, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Sete says something like, you know, when I, I was going to get married to Hallie, but, you know, baby Shugs found out that there wasn't going to be a ceremony or anything like that. She gave me some diamonds to make myself feel better or something like that. Um, yeah. I, so then I gave the diamonds to my baby. So like if she ever got lost in the nights, I could see her by the moonlight, something like that. Right. Is that right? Yeah. 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 And Also, um, I remember that in the film, right, she's doing Denver's hair and Denver says, ow, it hurts. Uh, But Sete doesn't like show any sort of care that Denver said, ow, my hair hurts while she's talking to Beloved. And I felt like there was the beginning of this sort of like jealousy between Denver and Beloved for the affection of Sete. You get what I'm saying? A little bit, but yeah, I think Denver was feeling jealous, but she never showed it because Mm -hmm. I think she also liked Beloved a lot as well, at least like in that time of the movie. So yeah, like Sethe sort of became more attached to Beloved 
as well. And she was taking more care of beloved, but actually like the only person uh, in one of their conversations, Denver finds out who beloved is actually like she spent the most time with her and uh yeah she sort of finds out but she doesn't want her mom to find out Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah there was also another thing that happened in that conversation between beloved sete uh while sete is doing denver's hair you know she said um that her mother was branded right and we don't see Sete's mother the entire time, but she's talking about, you know, what happened to her family. Uh, because Sete is sort of like all alone in the world. Like her father is gone and her mother was actually killed by the slave master. And she's talking about how her mother got, you know, hit with a brand and burned that into her skin so that the slave masters would know who she was. And uh, she never found out exactly why her parents were killed. But, uh, there's a flashback scene of, you know, Sete watching a whole bunch of black people be hanged. And uh, it's done by, you know, the light of a fire at night. And, you know, there's a lot to say about the scene, but I'll just say once again, Sete is like the most traumatized character I've ever seen on screen. Like she has lived through like the worst of the worst. Like it's insane. The flashbacks and memories she has, like, just one of her nightmares could be enough to fuel somebody to jump off a cliff. Like, that's how real it was. Do you remember that scene? Yeah, I do. And mm -hmm. I also remember every time they had those scenes where, like, Beloved would ask Sete a question. Mm -hmm. And uh, Denver would say, she never tells me that. Mm -hmm. So also you can see, like you said, Sete is very traumatized, but she never tells anything to Denver. Mm -hmm. So it's like she doesn't want to transfer that trauma to Denver, but that creates like a conflict between them because Denver can't get close to her mother because of her traumas mm -hmm. in an emotional sense. And she right. rather tells Beloved because she's thinking like, okay, like this girl is living with us now, but she's not my daughter or she's not like a family mm -hmm. or I don't know. For some reason, she feels comfortable with Beloved. Maybe yeah. something she wouldn't understand. Yeah, the interesting thing that this movie asks of its black audience is how do we deal with our generational trauma or what we actually go through individually that doesn't have anything to do with our, you know, uh, our, our ancestors, if there is anything as such. Like, do we just bottle it all inside? Do we let all of that rage, all of that pain, all of that disappointment, all of those fears just fester inside of us? and then haunt our house, haunt our energy, uh, taint our aura, or do we actually, like, just let it out? You know what I mean? Because I feel like this film is telling us, like, the way Sete handled it, while it is understandable to some degree, it ultimately wasn't healthy. And it took sort of love from other people, other black people, to bring her back to life to some degree. Not literally back to life, but, you know rejuvenate her soul because all that she was keeping inside, all the things she went through was, was eating her up. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, as someone who's studying psychology, like the best way to deal with trauma is not bottling it up, but mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, taking it out in healthy ways mm -hmm. and also recognizing it as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, like at this point in the movie, the only thing said they, did that was good for her to heal her trauma was being with Paul D. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, because yeah, like, um, sexual relationships are also healing, mm -hmm. uh, for some. Uh, so that's, that was the only thing like she was doing because she was sort of focused on being this like, uh, good mom, but also like just being able to survive and provide for her daughter. Right. And plus right. now she had like beloved to feed as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's the next scene right after, you know, beloved is telling her trauma to Paul, uh, to Sete. No, when Sete is telling her trauma to beloved, the next scene is Paul D 
Denver, beloved, and Sete sitting at the dinner table, and Paul D is basically saying everything he's seen on the road for the past 18 years. And he starts talking about, man, I was walking and I saw Negroes that were too scared to walk during the daytime because the white people were just that terrible. So they would climb up in the tree, sleep in the tree, and then only walk at night. I saw a black boy who was living in the woods all of his life, and he said he couldn't remember anywhere else. He saw a black woman who had no sense and was like killed for like, you know, stealing ducks, but cause she thought the ducks were her babies. And like, he was telling all this, like, like as a way of just letting it out. You know what I mean? And that reminded me so much of like being around my grandparents, hell, my own parents, when they would just let the shit out. You get what I'm saying? Like they would not hold it in. Like the stuff that I heard about what white people were doing at the office, <laughs> I'll always keep with me. And uh, I find that to be, I don't know if this is, you know, net toxic or whatnot, but I think it's a healthy way for black people to communicate living in this white supremacist world. And I feel like Paul D had a much better way of dealing with the hurt than Sete. I don't know. What did you think about Paul D, you know, just telling all those stories there, if anything? Yeah, I mean, I agree on that because, yeah, like when we have a safe environment to vent, it is psychologically helpful and that's like been proving like gossiping or venting is psychologically helpful if it's surrounded by you. Like if you're in the story as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Paul yeah. D was like that part. Definitely. She was sort he was sort of like sharing all the trauma he saw. Mm-hmm. And also you can like when she, he's sharing that you also see like this story is just one of them. Mm-hmm. You know, what about the story of the black child who lived in the forest? Mm-hmm. Like, what did she he go through? And, mm-hmm. you know, what about those people who, you know, walked only during the night? Like, that's insane. Yeah. Waiting ev- all day, every day in, in up in the trees, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you get that as well. And it kind of makes you think like, okay, I'm not the only one who's traumatized this way. And it helps. Like your society and community helps you in that way. Exactly. But we, we never know actually like what, you know, what happened to Paul D during like when she, he was in sweet home. Mm-hmm. Well, and we do kind of, I mean, a little bit. we'll have to pick up on this next time, everybody, because Simon Hill forgot that he's got English class right now, one online. So we'll come back in about an hour to do part two of reviewing beloved y'all stay tuned because this is going to get real deep it's you know not because of anything else it's just time constraints guys time constraints so part two of episode 60 will be on just give us about an hour or so y'all be easy out there and peace